grade. All right, today's the day that we are going to finish reading Crash. So we left off where um, Penn and Crash were going to have to race to see who would be going to the Penn Relays. Um, and they were going to be racing the next day. And the coach had practiced really, really hard, but Crash said he still heard Penn sprinting past his house the night before the race. So, all right, chapter 46, April 20th. I hardly ate breakfast. I didn't pay attention in class. I kept thinking of the race off today. The relays were Friday. The four, the four by 100 meter relay means four runners each run 100 meters. Each runner passes the baton to the next runner. The baton looks like a long foot pipe and it's light. It's made of aluminum. Since I'm the fastest, I'll probably run the anchor leg. The anchor gets the baton last. The anchor crosses the finish line. The anchor is your chance to win. The anchor gets the glory. All day long, I pictured Friday's race. Hubbard leads off. He hands the baton to Knowles. Halfway through the first turn, Knowles tears down the back stretch, hands it to Caruso. I crouch. I look back past my shoulder. They're all coming. Eight sprinters sprinting. I pick out Caruso. He's leaning into the final turn. He's 15 meters from me. 10 meters. I take off. I drag my left hand behind me, palm open. Fingers spread. Hit it. Hit it. Now. I feel the baton smack into my left hand. I curl my fingers around it. I switch it to my right hand and take off down the chalk-striped brick-colored lane. I'm dead last. Ten meters behind everybody. It's hopeless. By the time I hit the straightaway, I'm passing the next-to-last runner. Then the next. Then the next. 40,000 people leap to their feet. 80,000 eyes slide from the leader to the kid who's coming out of nowhere. Who is he? They ask. And the answer comes, it's Colgan, Crash Colgan of Springfield. I pass another, and now there are only three ahead of me, but that's not enough time. He can't do it, they scream, and now there are two ahead of me, and the red ribbon across the finish line seems close enough to be a blindfold. And they're hanging from the railings and stomping on the scoreboard, and there's only one ahead of me now. And the human hurricane is chasing me around the track, blowing at my back, and I'm on the leader's shoulders. And for an instant... The world freezes because we're dead even. Seeing us sideways, we look like one. And I remember the coach saying in a close race, the one who leans will win. So now with one last gasp, I throw my arms back and my chest forward and the red ribbon breaks like a butterfly across my chest. I slow down. I stop. I stand on the brick-colored track. I heave the baton into high into the air as the pennants wave over the stadium and the hurricane finally catches me, and I close my eyes and let it wash over me. Colgan. I kept returning to that dream all day until the coach's whistle blew, and he called, race off. And there I was, heading across the field to the starting line. The others trotted. I walked. I wasn't in a hurry. The stands were empty. A school bus moved in the distance beyond the football goalpost. Under the crossbar and between the uprights, like a framed picture, stood three people. For once, Webb's parents didn't look so old, not compared to the man standing between them. He was shorter than them and really skinny, like the prairie winds were eroding him away. But he was standing straight and by himself. No cane, no walker, just two legs. Ninety-three years old. Maybe it was the Missouri River mud. So that would be Penn's grandpa. And what, what happened before that is Crash was just running through the Penn relays like he'd already beat Penn, and he was at the relays, and that's what he's been daydreaming about. So now we're back to where the actual race between him and Penn are going, is taking place. The thought came to me. They would have liked each other, Scooter and Henry Wilhide Webb III, two storytellers, both from the great flat open spaces, one a prairie of grass, one of water. Both came to watch when no one else was there. Why exactly was he here? Did he know about me? Did he know his great-grandson could not win the race off and so would not run in the Penn relays? I wondered if Penn felt safe in his great-grandfather's bed. The cinder track crunched under my feet. There was five of us in the race. Me, Webb, two other seventh graders, and a sixth grader. The coach put us in lanes. Me and Webb were side by side. Again, he hadn't said a word to me all day. He, we milled around behind the starting blocks, nervous, shaking out our arms and legs. Everything as quiet as the coach had already said, ready. The other team members, jumpers, throwers, distance runners, had all stopped their practicing to watch. A single hawk, his wings tips spread like black fingers, kited over the school, and suddenly I saw something, a gift. 
A gift for a great-grandfather from North Dakota, maybe for all great-grandfathers, but the thing was, only one person could give that gift, and it wasn't the great-grandson, not on his fastest day alive. It was me. I hated that it was me. I tried not to see, but everywhere I looked, there it was. A gift. The gift. Let's go, boys, said the coach. A voice closer to me said, good luck. It was Webb, sticking out his dorky hand, smiling that old dorky smile of his. No button. I shook his hand, and it occurred to me that because he was always eating my dust, the dumb fish cake had never won a real race and probably didn't know how. And now, there wasn't time to learn. Don't forget to lean, I said to him. His face went black. The coach blank. The coach crawled. Ready? I got down, feet in the blocks, right knee on the track, thumbs and forefingers on the chalk, eyes straight up. And right then, for the first time in my life, I didn't know if I wanted to win. Set, knee up, rear up, eyes up. The coach says the most important thing here is to focus your mind. You, you are a coiled steel spring, ready to dart out at the sound of the gun. So what comes into my mind? Ollie, the one-armed octopus. He didn't disappear till the gun went off. I was behind. Not only Webb, but everybody. No problem. Within ten strides, I picked up three of them. That left only Webb. He was farther ahead of me than usual, but that was because of my rotten start. At the halfway mark, where I usually passed him, he was still ahead, and I still didn't know if I wanted to win. I gasped it. The gap closed. I could hear him puffing, like a second set of footprints. Cinder flecks from his feet specked at my, pecked at my shins. I was still behind. The finish line was closing. I kicked in the afterburners. Ten meters from the white string, we were shoulder to shoulder, breath to breath, grandson to great-grandson, and it felt new. It felt good. Not being behind, not being ahead but being even, and just like that, a half breath from the white string I knew. There was no time to turn to him. I just barked it out. Lean! He leaned. He threw his chest out. He broke the string. He won. Chapter 47. April 25th. I feel strange. I've been feeling that way since last Wednesday, since I lost the race saw. Lost. If I say the word aloud, it makes me shiver. At first, it was a strange, bad feeling. The instant Webb broke the string, I regretted what I had done. As he slowed down, he turned to me. He was confused. I knew what he was going to say. Did you let me win? But then the team was mobbing him, and I jogged off the track. The three people still stood under the crossbar, smiling their faces off. Thursday, I didn't go to practice. On the walk home, I looked once back at the track. The four relay runners were practicing baton handoffs. I felt sick. No practice on Friday. The coach took the four relay runners to Franklin Field in his car. Their race was scheduled at 2.20 p.m. At 2.20 p.m., I was sitting in math class. I tried to picture the race at Franklin Field, but funny thing, it kept being shoved aside by another picture. This one showed Henry Wilhide Webb standing, pumping his arms, shouting, and cheering. This morning, the announcement came on the PA. The Springfield team had come in second at the Penn Relays, our best finish ever. The principal gave the names of the three eighth graders, then he said, and the anchor leg was run by Penn Webb, who brought the team from last place to second. I could hear cheers from the homeroom down the hall. Inside, I cheered too. Chapter 48, April 30th. I was in the kitchen doing my job, cutting food coupons out of the magazines and newspapers, when I heard my mother yell. I ran to the living room. She was staring at Scooter's walker. It was lying at the foot of the stairs. She glanced into his room. Not there. She glanced up the stairs. I followed. I heard her say, Scooter. He was in the hallway staring at the picture of himself in the Navy uniform, the picture painted by his daughter, my mother. She stood behind him. She put her arms around him. How long has? How long have you been here? Bye-bye, he said. And you came up without your walker? Bye-bye. We looked at the picture with him. You know, my mom said to me, there's one way this painting is different from all the others. What's that, I said. He never posed for it. He didn't? No. I didn't paint it from a photograph either. How did you do it? She snuggled closer to him. From memory. He wasn't home very much in those days, but when I did see him, I looked and looked at him until he was locked in my mind's eye. I was terrified I forget what he looked like when he went away again. When I painted this, he was as clear in my head as if he was standing right there. She kissed his ear. Right, Scoot? A bye and you see how he's looking like he's saying something? Yeah, well, he is. He's saying, I'll be home soon, Lorraine. Bye-bye. 
Back downstairs, she joined me at the kitchen table clipping coupons. It's funny, she said. A while ago, I was remembering all that, and I was thinking how little I saw you kids and how little you saw me. And there was a minute back then when I actually was afraid you might forget what I looked like. No such luck, I said. She laughed. I know it sounds silly, but that was, that was just before I told my boss I was going part-time. About Scooter making up the stairs, I was surprised, but I wasn't. Two nights before, I had mixed up some Missouri River mud. I took it into Scooter's room and made up a story about a science project for school. Then I dipped his big toe in it. Chapter 49, July 2nd. So fast forwarding quite a ways. I still get that strange feeling like, is this really me? And I, Am I dreaming? But it's not a strange bad feeling anymore. It's sometimes just different, sometimes even good. So much has changed from a year ago. The grass in the backyard is halfway to my knees, and the weeds are a little higher than that. But the neighbors can't see because my father built a fence around it. Guess you could call it the world's smallest prairie. There's a little bed of soft stuff on the floor of the mouse house. Now Abby and I tell stories to Scooter. My mother goes to the garage sale every Saturday morning. She goes to the supermarket, then gives double coupons. Whenever I ask her if she's gotten me anything from second time around, she reminds me that I told her that I didn't want to know. All I know is there's a suspicious-looking shirt hanging in my closet. I used my sneaker money to buy Mom a set of paints. She's going to start by painting us all again. We're going to the ball game. My mother got the tickets, five of them, for herself, Scooter, Abby, me, and my father. He says he won't have time to go. My mom says he'll be there. Abby bet me a water ice that my mom will win. I said my dad, hope I lose. I've been invited to a 4th of July party at Jane Forbes. And then, it's always the last sentence. I just want to tell you, who's his best friend? Ted Webb. Such a great story. So, there you are. Make sure you go. Sorry. Make sure you go and answer the question. And I hope you enjoyed the book as much as I do. Have a great day. See ya.